Welcome, everyone. Uh, Michael Belkin, are you there? Uh, can you hear me, George? Yeah, we got you. We got you. Great. Glad, glad, All right. Glad we got this to work out. We had so much trouble getting this spaces. I mean, I don't know. Others will, will uh, speak up later, but space has just been crazy the last the last few days. So Wednesday, April 12th. Glad we're able to do this. Great to see you back, Michael. Um, as is our custom, I'm just going to go through this date in history very quickly, and then we're going to get right into it. Um, I always learn something. Hopefully you do as well. Um, okay, so Wednesday, April 12th. I'm just reading from the AP. Interesting. Um, the Civil War started on this day in April 12th, 1861, as Confederate forces opened fire on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. In 1945, FDR died of a cerebral hemorrhage in Warm Springs, Georgia, at the age of 63. He was succeeded by Vice President uh, Harry S. Truman. And then finally, uh, I made a pick from, um, in 1963, Martin Luther King was arrested and jailed in Birmingham, Alabama, charged with contempt of court and parading without a permit. During his time behind bars, King wrote his letter from Birmingham jail. At any rate, there you go. So Wednesday, April 12th, interesting times. Uh, Michael, it's been a while since uh, you've been in our space. Um, I believe you've had a change of heart of late. Um, You've uh, been quite a adroit at um, calling the turns. And um, so kind of curious to hear what's on your mind. So, um Michael, um, you're no stranger uh, to the Twitter spaces and become a crowd favorite. I'll just let you have at it, and we'll get into a dialogue, and hopefully we'll have some other folks come up here and get into a good Q&A. So, Michael, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, George, for having me. Um, okay, just to review uh, for everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't know who I am or if you've, uh, you, know, you are familiar with me, what do I do? So um, I have a forecasting model. It's based on time series analysis. I came out of the UC Berkeley Business School and Statistics Department. Um, I worked, uh, I, I studied time series analysis, which is Fourier and uh, Box Jenkins ARIMA models. Um, that got me into Solomon Brothers back in 1986. I refined and developed my model while I was there. And I ended up, uh, I started out in market analysis with Laszlo Barini worked in equity research, prop trading, all kinds of different, wore a lot of different hats there, and um, ended up in proprietary trading. There were four of us on the um, equity side doing trading the house account, kind of what Meriwether was doing on the, on the bond side in the liar's poker days. Um, uh, and uh, anyways, I left there. Uh, Solomon kind of blew up in 1991. Uh, I l started the Belkin Report in 1992, so I've been doing it for 31 years now. Long time. Okay, so what do I do? The model gives a 12-period forward forecast, and I'm using weekly and monthly data. And uh, so my forecast horizon, 12 weeks, 3 months in the weekly data, and monthly, 12 months, 1 year. So my forecast horizon is three months and 12 months, depending on the data being used. Uh, shorter term stuff too, but I don't usually put that into the Belkin report. I kind of use that for um, fine tuning things as close as possible. But okay, so the model, what does the model do? It gives direction, position, and intensity. Direction, up, down, or neutral. Position, beginning, middle, end and intensity or confidence interval. So direction, position, intensity, that's what I do. And it's not, you know, people say, oh, you're a technical analyst. Well, not really. Um, I'm, uh, it's statistical forecasting, you know, it's time series analysis. So it's not like technical, most technical analysts look at a chart, it ends today, and they wait for something to change, you know, for some trend line to break or something. So um, I look at, you know, everybody looks at charts, I look at charts, but that's not what I, what, what my, uh, research is based on it's based on forecasting so and the, so getting back to the idea of looking for turning points you can see these turning points coming in the forecast so i sit here every weekend you know work 12 hours days friday through monday applying the model starting you know with stock indexes sectors industry groups um stocks within the groups uh that's in the u.s and europe and uh 
groups in Japan, and then all the macro stuff, you know, bonds, foreign exchange, um, commodities, et cetera. And I'm always looking for, remember the model gives direction, position, intensity. I'm looking for the strongest signals. Um, experience has taught me that uh, to go with the strongest signals, you know. All right, so that's what I do. So what is the model saying? Uh, just to back up a second here. Um, I was bearish, if you recall, last year uh, until October. So I've been on these spaces looking for the market to trade down. And, you know, the NASDAQ got killed last year. A lot of stocks got decimated. Tiger Global blew up, et cetera. Um, all those kind of things. Down, Tiger Global down 50%. Um, my work changed on October 17th. So I was, um, I've been long the market for five months from October 17th until March 17th. Um, and over that time period, uh, so what changed? Uh, my model changed. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's the bear market still and everything, but you get these big moves. And you know, I just learned from experience doing this for 30 something years, you gotta catch some of these moves. Um, and so my model changed, I changed. So I went along the NASDAQ and, and Tesla and all these things way back then. And just to give you, let's put things in perspective. Where are we? How did we get here? So since October, um, the NASDAQ NDX is up 23% th from trough to peak. The S&P is up 15%. New York FANG index is up 51%. Now, these dates, they don't all, they're not all exactly October to March, but um, so New York Fang, for instance, November 9th, it bottomed, it peaked March 31st, up 51%. New York Fang, so that's, you know, Microsoft, Apple, et cetera, you know, Google, Alphabet, uh, Meta, all those kind of stocks. So those stocks drove the market, and they were my favorite longs over this period. Didn't make me very popular in certain circles. <laughs> uh, um, and I, I have to tell you, I was, I, you know, I'm also, as well as doing the model, I'm an investment strategist, okay? So how do the pieces of the puzzle fit together? What are the fundamentals, et cetera? You know, what's going on in the economy? What is the Fed doing? Monetary policy, money supply, all that kind of stuff, interest rates. So um, I wear two hats. The model gives me a discipline that I have to stick with. Okay, so for timing things, everything's based on the model. But, you know, I'm looking at how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. So anyways, the FANG, was really the only game in town. That was what that is what drove the market up. So the S and P was up only fifteen percent. New York Fang up three times, more than three times that much. Um, uh, so it was all a few stocks driving the market up, and I was I was on board that for as long as it lasted. So basically, where are we now? Oh, by the way, Tesla up ninety eight percent. Sorry, George, from January third uh, to February fifteenth. They, so they really squeezed some of these stocks. ARC up 41% from December 28th to February 2nd. So the dates are kind of all over the map, but generally in that time frame of October to March. So where are we now? Having that's, the, that's where we've been. So I was bearish before, bullish from October to the end of to late March. I didn't get the absolute high, but uh, increasingly my stuff is very bearish. So I think this uh, in the well, just speaking from the model perspective. I've got everything turning down big time. And um, I'll get into the sectors in a second, which is really a lot of what drives, drives my work. And I don't think people really um, follow it maybe as closely as I do. You know, as again, I spend 12 hours a day all weekend, you know, doing this, looking at the sectors and stocks within the groups. But um, so I think uh, my hypothesis here is the market hit an important peak March 31st, end of the quarter. People jacked up their stocks, you know, to, to reward themselves, their compensation, the longs, and um, it worked. You know, they got uh, they got it to March 31st. So S and P went a little bit higher, it, April 3rd, a point or two higher, but generally it's right around there. Uh, March 31st was the high in Fang. So I got everything turning down, big time. So I think the next wave of uh, of the bear market has started. It's going down. And it's been very frustrating. Of course, I don't need to tell you that, but you know, if just look at a chart. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, you know, look at the, I, I follow the cues. That's what I look at mostly, you know, QQQs just to see what the market's doing. And there's been these like kamikaze dip buyers taking this, jacking this stuff up since March 31st. I count one, two, three, four, five, six, including one today, six, they're trying to jam it 
like they didn't get the mo the memo, you know, or they're not subscribers to the Belkin Report, whatever. Anyways, somebody really loves the market here. You know, they really want to jam it up, whatever it is, you know, ODTE, one day to expiration options, you know, gamers, whatever it is. So people are still jamming it, but it ain't working. So if you look at these little intraday flips, it goes up for a few hours and then rolls over and goes to a lower low. So we're, we're, we're kind of in this painstaking process where the market's topping the queues. And um, and so that's why uh, on an index level, that's what's happening. Now, more importantly, what what really changed for me is the sector rotation. So as I mentioned, New York Fang, you know, Fang stocks, that was my biggest long for five months. Not anymore. But so um, the rotation really, really, really changed big time over the last maybe three, four weeks. So whereas tech was outperforming the S&P and tech was my number one long, all of a sudden tech is topping. And it's not just tech. So we had the bank thing hit, you know, um, uh, S Silicon Valley Bank Corp, and then the financials got whacked. So that's, that was set, sent the first, you know, kind of shot across the bow of the market. And, and so the banks got killed. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, then, like, last week, in the last two weeks, all of a sudden, the cyclicals got destroyed. Like, I, I mean, I don't see people talking about this at all, but tech, industrial stocks, material stocks, consumer discretionary stocks, um, as well as tech, technology and financials. So what was driving the market higher? Technology, pretty much. Every, that was the only thing that came in town, right? Now... Technology is rolling over, not massively yet, just kind of, you know, bottom of the first inning. But financials over have rolled over big time. Um, hold on. Okay. Uh, sorry. You still there? Got, um, my phone kind of blanked out for a second. Um, so all of a sudden, I, you have like groups like machinery, um, electrical equipment, uh, all that stuff rolling over big time and I, what i do i will i look a lot at ratios so i'm looking at a ratio of the sectors to the index and there's a lot of information there i i'm some people look at this some people most people don't i don't think or they would if they were they would be seeing what i'm seeing so and then i'm applying the forecast to the ratios of the sectors right there's 10 or so sectors and all of a sudden cyclicals you know, forecast down, just starting, first, second inning. Financials down. They got whacked. They bounced back a little bit, but the forecast is down. And so what is turning up? There's got to be something going up in the market in relative terms, right? Well, guess what it is? Utilities, consumer staples, healthcare, energy, and gold stocks. Gold stocks isn't really a sector, but it's something that, that's going up. Uh, it's something that I follow closely. So these are chicken longs, right? Like nobody wants to buy P PEG, PEG, or Procter & Gamble, or Pepsi, or Coke. I mean, these are not sexy go-go momentum stocks, right? When what I've learned, you know, again, 30-something years doing this, when the rotation turns into defensive sectors, that is a huge risk-off signal, all right. And generally, it means the economy is going down the tubes. You know, it doesn't when I get big signals like this, it's generally very significant. So what is going up? Like, uh, by the way, um, I want to do a little digression here. I'm reading this book now about this investor called Robert Wilson. Some of you probably heard of him. He kind of predated Soros and Steinhardt and all those guys. He was the first hedge fund guy starting back in the 50s and 60s. And he um, basically pyramided his wealth from, he got, he inherited 150,000 uh, and he pyramided it to 230 million by 1986 and 800 million by 2000. And what did he do? His trading methodology was long short. Okay, market neutral. He started out, long only and he got killed in a few bear markets and then he he realized he had to be short so he picked long and short stocks so he's market neutral long short so uh you know that is a way to create a synthetic bull market 
that's one of my little phrases I coined long ago. You can create a synthetic bull market by being long something and short something else. Then you've got your long a ratio, and you don't care what the market does. All you care is the difference between your longs and your shorts. So that's what Robert Wilson did. He was fantastically successful. And um, the reason I bring that up is so pair trades. And this is something we did at Solomon, you know, not massively. We're more directional, but, um, you know, there was a pair trade in the prop trading unit. So different, different groups were doing that. So if you want to be long, I I'm going to give some people won't understand this, but if you for the next three months, minimum three plus months, long utilities, staples, healthcare, energy, and gold stocks. I'm talking about energy in a second, but say X, X, say utilities, that's XLU, staples, XLP, these are ETFs, healthcare, XLV, ETF, energy, XLE, and gold stocks, GDX. So you can be long those, but if the market's going down a lot, they might not necessarily go up in absolute terms. So you, if you want to be like Robert Wilson or you know what a typical hedge fund was originally supposed to do, market neutral, longs and shorts, then you want to be short financials, technology, industrials, materials, and consumer discretionary. And the, um, the symbols for those, these are all deep liquid ETFs, pretty liquid. Financials, XLF, technology, XLK, industrials, XLI, and materials, XLB and consumer discretionary XLY. So you can do like a, you know, off five, you know, long, long the first ones and short the second ones or different, you know, long utilities, short technology, XLU, short XLK, things like that. Um, X long staples, XLP, short industrials, XLI. So there's all kinds of combinations. That's the universe of things that should work. Um, okay, so the market's going to trade down according to the forecast, just starting bottom of the first inning, next move down. Um, the defense, the rotation has gone just completely risk off. As, as clear as it gets in my work, I mean, pound the table. Like I used to go up every day uh, to my boss, Stanley Shopcorn, who is vice chairman of Solomon. He was head of equities. I would pound on the table when I had a signal like this, you know, oh, you know, last couple of years I was there, things would set up. And George, as you know, shorting Japan, that was what we did. We were massively short the Nikkei from the uh, beginning of 1990, most of the way down, had a great year in prop trading. So I would, pound, I'd, I would physically pound on the table, say, Stanley, Stanley, it's going down. Look at this forecast. So I, I'm pounding the table here saying the sector rotation has changed. It's gone completely risk off. So if you're a portfolio manager, get out of tech. And don't buy the dip in financials. Get out of cyclicals. And consumer discretionary, that's the consumer, you know. All right, so that's the market's supposed to trade down big, just starting. The rotation is completely risk off. Let's talk about energy for a second. I was short energy until um, two weeks ago. Okay, so uh, put that in perspective. Here's what happened. Um, crude oil. Let's take USO. From January, it was 72 until March 17th, it was 58. Went down 19%. So crude oil went down 19%. Same thing with XLE, the energy sector ETF, energy stocks. Same period, basically January to March. So down 19%, January 26th to March 20th. Energy bottomed. Um, and so OPEC came out and cut uh, production by one point something uh, million barrels a day to take effect in another month. Um, that t flipped my model around. So I'm not a broken clock. The Belkin report changes. Like I said, changed back up to October, changed now, you know, just recently, last few weeks. Uh, changed on energy. So I think uh, I've got an upward forecast for crude oil prices, upward forecast for energy stocks. That's fresh, relative, and absolute. So um, my report this week, I do a weekly report, Belgian report for institutional investors, is called Double Whammy. And the double whammy is we've got um, energy prices going up. Uh, and, and, you know, so what is crude oil is now, what, $83 a barrel today, uh, front month. Uh, where could it go? 90, 100, I don't know. It's direction up, intensity strong, position just starting. So we're going, um, that is on top of the banking crisis, okay? Which, let's talk about the banking crisis for a second. Um, so 
the banks, I agree with Warren Buffett for once. You know, most of the time I find myself kind of, you know, not necessarily agreeing with him. But uh, he said today that the bank that w the bank crisis isn't going away. More banks are going to fail. I agree. But he also said you're not going to lose money as a depositor, which I also agree with because Janet Yellen, the bailout queen, and, um, you know, Powell, the bailout king, are going to bail out the banks. But they're going to bail out the depositors. They're not going to bail out the um, shareholders, okay? The shareholders are toast. So let's put the banking crisis in perspective. And um, I wish we could put, put up a, I did a meme on this today of the good fellows with the two guys laughing saying, you know, the Fed stress tested the banks for everything except rising interest rates. What morons. They, they raised, they just rose, they just raised the Fed funds rate by 475 basis points, right? From 0% to 475 basis points. They're probably going to, they claim, you know, they swear they're going to do another, uh, you know, 25 basis points in May. But, um, and so they, they're, they are the bank regulators and they, they gave these banks glowing, you know, pass ratings on the, uh, on their stress tests. They didn't test them for rising interest rates. This is a crack up. I mean, you know, I mean, these guys need to be held personally responsible. Powell and Yellen. So Yellen, you know, Fed chairman for, you know, for however long after the credit crisis, kept interest rates at zero and said, oh, we've got to keep interest rates. The economy so weak, you know, and Powell did the same thing. He did a token right interest rate rise before the COVID crisis and then dropped interest rates back down to zero, held them there for a couple of years. So what did that do? These these dumb ass bankers believed the Fed and the Treasury and said, oh, interest rates, then I'm going to increase my interest rates margin by I'm going to buy bonds. So they buy bonds, right, when the interest rates are zero, and then interest rates go up, their bonds go down by 20, 30 percent, right? And, um, and then, uh, so now this is kind of an old story, right? Like, so the, bond, the bonds sold off sharply ages ago. You know, so the, the, big, the decline in the bond market's over, as far as I'm concerned. But it's left these banks nursing these 20 30% losses on their long-term securities, also on their loans, of course, et cetera. So whatever you mark to the market. So it didn't matter until it mattered. All of a sudden, S Silicon Valley Bank Corp. So they start losing deposits. And what do they have to do? They have to sell their securities that are supposedly held to maturity at a loss. And it wipes out their capital. So the same thing with First Republic, right? FRC, they're, they're negative capital. And they're, they're, the same thing's going to happen to them, probably, unless somebody's dumb enough to buy them and lose a bunch of money, unless, the, you know, somebody... So anyways, this thing is going to keep going on. A lot of regional banks are basically have lost more money on their positions, on their, on their uh, stupid long uh, positions that were uh, prompted and instigated by stupid Federal Reserve and Treasury monetary policies. So these guys are in trouble. So what is, it, what, what is the effect? Um, so you're not going to lose money as a depositor, probably, because the Fed will bail you out. But the bank is not going to be able to lend. Hey, okay. Michael, can I interrupt for one second? Are, are you moving around the house at all? Because you just kind of broke up there a little bit. Okay. Is that better? Is yeah, that better? Just, you, you, you're doing great just until now. So don't try to stay in one place if you can. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, sometimes my phone kind of tends to start going to sleep. Maybe that was what happened. So back to the banks. So uh, report this week entitled Double Whammy. In, uh, energy prices up, just starting. Okay, direction up, intensity strong, position just starting. Energy stocks up. Um, bank crisis, what does it amount to? It, it amounts to the economy the, I mean, I don't need to tell you this. Look, just look out there. Bank lending down, huge. You know, so if you're like a small business or a home borrower or somebody, you're not. There's going to be a big contraction in credit. And you know what this reminds me of? You know, I'm reading this history of Keynes on Skidelsky. It's a great book. Um, man, it's taking months to read. It's like an encyclopedia length. But um, it's about you know the the 30s, the depression, the 20s. You know, Keynes, the the, the um, you know, I'm no Keynes fan, but he, it's definitely uh, instructive to read this book. I highly recommend it if you want to know history yeah, and what Michael, was going on behind Michael, the scenes. Yeah, Michael, yeah? Tell, so what, what is the name of the book again for everyone? What's the name of the book? Uh, Robert Keynes. I think it's called Diplomat, uh, something like that. If you just Google Skidelsky Keynes, it'll pop right up. Skidelsky. It's, it's okay, the, perfect. 
All right. Okay. It's, it's the benchmark um, biography of Keynes. And uh, trust me, if you if you start reading it, it will take forever to read. But it's it's definitely worth it. Interesting guy. But let, let's not get um, the the point of bringing that up was um, the banking crisis, the depression. Okay, it was because of banks going under and the, the end of bank credit. Right, I, and so these Fed, I don't get it. You know, these guys are well. Even Mary Daly, San Francisco Fed head, right? She resurfaced today. She's like she's been laying low because she was in charge, supposedly, of regulating the bank that went under. So when, when all of a sudden Silicon Valley Bank, you know, this this Mary person um, who Janet Yellen, Yellen promoted to be head of San Francisco Fed um, went back in her Fed days. Uh, by the way, I I know some of these people from my Berkeley, UC Berkeley days. You know, I used to, you know I was at the 2012 meeting, uh, Cal Berkeley alumni meeting where Yellen presented her, we've got to, we've got to communicate clearly. So when you see these Fed speakers coming out all the time, that goes back to this Janet Yellen policy she started. It used to be they kept their mouths shut, you know, and they would surprise the market, but not anymore. But anyways, the point is credit availability going down the tubes. And these guys are still talking about raising interest rates. I mean, this is Great Depression stuff. Now, I'm not saying we're have, gonna have a great replay of the Great Depression. I'm saying that these are the conditions. If you read the book or read the history about what caused the Great Depression, it was a contraction in credit. And by the way, there's a great um, uh, video that came out today with uh, uh, John Hopkins, Hanky. He's talking about the money supply. He's, you know, he's a monetarist and the money supply is down 3% and it's at a six, that's an annual rate to a 6%, six month annualized rate is down way more than that. And that's before bank credit started, you know, contracting. So the, this is my investment strategist hat. I'm saying we've got higher energy prices are going to crimp the consumer. The gas price, which is already 450 something a, bar a, a gallon around where I live, it's going to be going up. You know, look up for the next three months, higher energy prices. Thank you, OPEC. I didn't have anything to do with it, but, you know, it's it's for real. It's probably going to continue. And then we've got this bank credit contraction on top of it. So basically, this is going to hit the consumer over the top of the head, right? And small businesses and everything. So, um, by the way, so I looked at earnings, you know, S&P earnings. I, I, I had a forecast they're going down to 100 or something last time when I was on here about a year or so ago. They haven't gone down that. They're below 100. So the latest S&P earnings, operating earnings, are about 50 bucks on the Standard & Poor's site, which annualizes at 197. Reported earnings are 45 a quarter, which annualizes at about 171. And that's before this next wave hits, okay? So I, I think we've got the economy's in trouble, the banking system is in trouble. It's gonna. It's not going to be so easy to get loans. It's not the end of the world. You know, the banks are not all going to disappear or something. You know, you don't have to run. But there's. But oh, so I did have a professor, David Pyle, famous guy. He was my banking professor at UC Berkeley, and um, he actually wrote me a letter of recommendation that helped get me into Solomon Brothers. Um, I was a big student of the banking stuff back then. Um, his the reason I bring that up. He was talking about disintermediation. That's a term you don't see anymore. But back then, it was ta people taking their money out of savings and loans, and it caused the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s. Um, so, uh, and they were putting it into you know CDs and money market funds and things like that. So basically, it drove the capital. It destroyed the capital of the savings and loan industry. Disintermediation. Nobody uses that word anymore. Uh, it's something I studied. Anyways, w w we're obviously having something similar happening now. So you're, people are looking at these banks, and you got like what? F nothing on your on your savings account, you know, unless you tie it up in a CD. So disintermediation dis now means taking your money out of key bank or, so, you know, whatever, all these regional banks and putting it into money market funds, right? That's the logical thing. Or into JP Morgan Chase or some bank you feel more confident with. But even those guys are losing deposits. So um, anyways, that's a, that's a very powerful force of uh, negative influence on, on the banks and the credit system. Okay, enough said on that. So let's talk about sentiment for a second. Sentiment. So as I said, I was not a popular guy, you know, after, 
<laughs> saying, you know, for turning bullish back in October, I, I didn't get, you know, a lot of people were calling, oh, thanks for telling, you know, no, no. <laughs> it was like, what? Delta, are you crazy? You know, it's a bear market. Nah, 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 nah. So sentiment was negative um, on the market and it went up. It didn't go straight up. It was difficult, you know, but my, I stayed, you know, stayed the course. So, um, but where are we now in sentiment? It's kind of, it's, it's weird, sentiment and positioning. So let's just start with the CNN fear and greed index. Today, 62, greed. A couple of weeks ago, March 15th, 24, extreme fear. So we just went from extreme fear to greed, not extreme greed, but um, that was like one of the most rapid increases I remember seeing. And, uh, and what happened? The market topped, right? So like we, we're not going up anymore, but people are greedy, right? That's on the CNN stuff anyways. Um, so you, you do see, you know, hedge fund surveys and stuff. People are not all bold up, right? Obviously, they're seeing the same stuff I'm talking about. And you got to be like um, not entirely uh, in control of your senses to be super bullish right now if you're a hedge fund guy, particularly if you got destroyed. You know, a lot of hedge funds did not do well in the decline last year. And so they got bearish at the bottom and, you know, maybe they stayed short during the rally. And now they're kind of like they're maybe they're up a little bit on the year, but, you know, they're not swinging for the fences anyways. So hedge funds are not positioned, you know, all, extremely bullishly for the most part. H however, um, the fund flows have not been good the last few weeks. We'll find out tomorrow. It comes out every Thursday. The fund, the retail investor flows, at, you know, Bank of America just came out with a thing saying they've been $3 billion of selling last week, you know. And so, anyways, the, the sentiment, which is really important, it's not entirely crystal clear, except the CNN, people got really bullish right at the top, basically. That's what I can say from the fear and greed index. The people are not positioned I don't think it's their position for what I'm saying. They're not short tech. Okay, so this big change for me is tech's going down. And not only that, FANG is going down. New York FANG is going down. So um, that would be Apple. All of a sudden, we had this Apple news, right? <clears throat> Apple's computer sales down 50 60% or something. Um, it's not their phone sales. <clears throat> you know, it's not the end of yeah, Apple. But all of a sudden, shot across the bow of of uh, the supposedly bulletproof stocks that are going to take the market higher. Tesla, so I've got Tesla as a short, um, what else? And those FANG plus kind of stocks. Um, uh, Meta, now there's a, man, if you've got a, let me just say one little di digression about Meta. If you've got a Facebook account, you know, um, first of all, Meta, he, he swiveled to this Meta, right? Which is a total flop. He spent how much? $8 billion, some kind of thing. Zuckerberg, right? And then it totally it disappeared. Nobody's interested in it, right? So now he renamed the company and everything. And now, you know, if you on Facebook, I get, I constantly get these misinformation. I get, it's like a school teacher t knocking my, knocking my, my uh, knuckles with a with a ruler. You can't post things on there without these libtards coming on and and telling you you can't say that or this is wrong. And, and they have no idea what they're talking about. They can contract with these people in Africa or something. Anyways, I I think Meta is a short. Okay, it's it's been very strong. The models has Meta turning down, topping. Um, Apple topping. What Microsoft not so much yet, uh, but uh, it's coming. All those stocks basically topping, turning over. Um, and if you go down the list, you go into the Belkin report. Let's go there for a second. So uh, what do I do? I, I do the sectors and everything, like I said. And then in the Belkin report for institutional investors, I have on page six, long and short ideas. And so that's a, a, why a lot of people subscribe to the report. <clears throat> so left side, stronger US industry group prospects, page six. Right side, weaker U.S. industry group prospects. Let's go down the list for a second. So everything's ranked on this page. Top, you know, they're ranked in order of um, <clears throat> industry groups and then stocks within the group on the first line are the strongest signals. So let me just go down. Stronger U.S. industry group prospects, electric utilities, multi-utilities, water utilities, food products, beverages, <clears throat> excuse me, household products, food and drug retailers, pharmaceuticals, gold mining, oil and gas, biotech, Healthcare equipment, healthcare providers, gas utilities, diversified telecom. The biggest bunch of chicken longs you've ever seen in your life. 
stocks like Southern, SO, um, water utilities, nobody even looks at those. I mean, they're the cheap, best, most chicken longs you could possibly get. Food products, you know, uh, beverages, Pepsi. <laughs> That's not a bull market stock, obviously. Gold mining, Kinross Gold, things like that. Um, uh, oil and gas, D DVN, EOG, Oxy. I'm there with um, <clears throat> with Warren Buffett. Uh, so what are the cells? <clears throat> Banks. Uh, you know, they're down some, but I, you know, there's, like I said, the, the bailouts aren't going to save the, the, um, the, the stockholders. You know, the, the basically they, they wipe out the equities. So it's not, you know, they could bounce a little bit. But um, I think they're a good short hold. Money center banks, you know who, Bank of America, et cetera, JP Morgan, Citibank, securities brokers, great shorts. If you're looking for shorts, look at brokers. They're way, way up in the weekly, in the long term, not so much in the intermediate term. But um, I, these guys are exposed to the credit crisis, right? So Morgan, Stanley, sorry, Mike Wilson, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's been bearish. He, he kind of missed the rally. You know, I'm, I, I'm agreeing with him on the market now, but um, I'm, <laughs> Morgan Stanley to me is like one of the things you want to short if you think the market's going down. Sorry, Mike. Uh, Schwab, you know, things like that. Um, asset managers. Oh, man. So, okay. The bond, let's talk about bonds for a second. Um, okay. So the bonds, I'm bullish on bonds. I think bonds have bond futures have bottomed um and 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 the people there's still massive short positions in treasury bonds massive like huge they haven't covered anything so the guys who made a lot of money being short bonds last year <clears throat> are there in size still massively so i think there's a po potential for a huge short covering rally in bonds which kind of it sounds contradictory to my outlook for banks right because it means they're their long-term securities will come back. But th again, this is yesterday's story. They're down so much, the bank's long-term securities, they could come back by 10 or 20%, and it's they're coming off of a big decline. Anyways, uh, but further diving deeper into the bond market, credit spreads widening. So I got mortgage credit spreads widening. There's a, there's an ETF <clears throat> for uh, mortgage-backed securities. That's a short. Um, High-yield spreads widening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Getting back to the brokers and to asset managers. Okay, so asset managers, junk bond shops. There's only a couple, three or four of them, right? You know the names, KKR, Cargill, Apollo, and Blackstone. These guys, I think, are going to be in trouble. They're exposed to the wrong stuff, okay? They've, they've kind of been milking the bubble, and they've, they are... They are shorts. Okay, enough said. Um, other asset managers, uh, Franklin Resources, you know, Ben, things like that. He, they, they've got a huge exposure to emerging market debt. And I'm not, I'm only positive on government bonds, not on high yield, not on emerging market debt, just governments everywhere. Uh, semiconductors, okay? These are my best favorite longs, right? Now they're my favorite shorts. So I don't want to give, a, give away a bunch of names, but you can use your imagination. They're more of the kind of intermediate sized ones. Um, NVIDIA, not yet, it's almost there. <clears throat> um, internet stocks, a lot of crappy, you know, well, maybe that's the wrong word. Anyways, not, you know, not the best quality uh, internet stocks. Th these, by the way, had the huge bounce potential back in October. Now, their favorite shorts. So Etsy, things like that, you know, um, blah. I, I don't want to give them all away, you know, this is out of respect for my subscribers. Software. Okay. Software, the stocks, the um, <clears throat> cloud software names. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not used to talking this much. Sitting out here on the island in, in Puget Sound, <laughs> minding my own business. Anyways, I'm, uh, my voice is starting to croak a little bit. Sorry. So, Cloud software stocks, you know the names, 20, 30, 40 times revenues at the peak. Um, <clears throat> those were long, great longs for me. I got them turning over again. So you know some of these, George Toast, things like that. Shopify, somebody came out with a buy recommendation on Shopify today, bounced up, uh, sold, reversed, you know, it ended up, I didn't see how it closed, but um, uh, it's a short to me. Okta, Hubs, all these kind of things, things that were... Um, Tiger Global favorite longs that blew them up, 
they were favorite longs for me October to end of March, five months. Now they're shorts again. So short software, computers, Apple, uh, all of them, what these things, SMCI, there's a lot of names in here. Uh, I don't, I don't want to give them all away. Social media rolling over, machinery. These are my short ideas from top to bottom. Insurance, credit cards, there's one for you. Um, auto finance, okay. Now these guys have been another milking the bubble. All of a sudden subprime lenders are, subprime borrowers <clears throat> are behind, uh, you know, delinquency rates are way up. So auto finance, emerging market banks, s retailers, okay, exposed to the consumer, RH, GPS, ROST, things like that. Metals and mining, steel companies. Uh, well, I'm just going down the list. I don't want to give the whole thing away. Auto components, autos, Tesla, GM. So basically, you get the idea. Economy, I'll kind of wrap it up here. Um, wait a minute. Is it... Michael, okay. uh, uh, yeah, my, yeah. Michael this, you've uh, really been quite a role here and throwing so many names at people. It's uh, an embarrassment of riches. So maybe um, why don't you just uh, chill for a second here. Um, could you just talk a little bit about the dollar and related to that, um, your views on, on, uh, on gold and gold stocks? Sure. Okay. Um, so I do... Um, I have a, a gold report, first of all. It's a retail thing. My institutional thing is really expensive. It's for hedge funds. Well, it's real expensive. It's like one second of their NAV uh, Andrew Day move. But um, it's it's an institutional product, the Belkin report. It goes into great detail. The The gold report is more, <clears throat> more for individual investors. So I started covering investable gold stocks back in 2016. So I developed a database and I, I apply the model to everything. So I look for stocks that are going to outperform. And I'm, I'm very cynical. You know, the gold space is full of charlatans. Um, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of the gold <clears throat> services focus on micro cap stocks, 20, $50 million market caps that don't have anything and they're just drilling, right? And uh, it's the old Mark Twain. Uh, a gold mine is a hole in the ground with a liar on top. Um, I'm not, not, obviously not all companies are like that, but those are not the companies I cover. I cover companies with, you know, produce production and reserves, investable. And even those, you know, they're not such big market caps. So um, I'm, I'm bullish on those. They, there's still a lot of them that are down massively from their highs. Okay, dollar. Long-term forecast monthly is down for the dollar. Okay, and so that's DXY down. And so what are you going to say? So the dollar is going to go down. What is it going to go down against? What's going to go up versus the dollar? So yeah, the Euro, Swiss franc, the Japanese yen, things like that. Um, but it's not like those are like quality <laughs> you know, currencies or something, right? Like and they've, they've got their problems. I, I'd say from an interest rate differential <clears throat> perspective, Europe is kind of behind the U.S. on raising interest rates, right? So the Fed's already raised interest rates by almost 500 basis points. E ECB is like way behind that, right? One or two percent is all they've done. So that, so just from that perspective, favors their currencies. You know, the do you know what for fundamental, all I can say is the long-term forecast is down for the dollar. So DXY down and gold up. So gold is the inverse of the dollar. Gold up versus the dollar, and um, so. Now, the question is, <clears throat> when you start going into a recession um, some, and, and, a, and a severe market decline, which we could be on the brink of, you know, not, maybe not tomorrow morning, but pretty soon, um, then everything gets dumped. So hopefully, uh, generally, um, you know, Steve Hanke got into this in his video today. You, you should look. It's worth watching. Uh, it's on Wealthion. It's on YouTube. Um, he's a good guy. I like him. And um, he, he, anyways, uh, he, he makes the point that <clears throat> gold and energy can r usually rally early into a recession and then reverse. So I think we're basically on the rally phase going into a recession in gold and energy. So I like gold stocks. And um, it, the gold report, which I just I do it every two weeks, um, there's a lot of really interesting names that are just turning up. It's not Newmont and, and Barrick, you know, it's um, more like Kinross. Um, there's some smaller intermediate sized ones. I don't want to give all the names away here, but um, uh, Anglo Gold, Ashanti, AU, KGC, things like that. Um, I think they're in like maybe second, third inning 
uh, in the forecast. So turning up, big potential there. Um, you know, so I like them. I awesome. don't like the dollar, like gold. Got it. So, Michael, um, your flexibility to swing from one direction to the other is uh, impressive. Uh, I wish I had taken, um, you know, paid more attention to you last fall when you when you made the turn. I paid dearly for it by not listening. Um, how would you uh, describe your conviction level uh, in the sense that you know, you've been doing this a long time. Sometimes the, the model is you know, it's early, it's, 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 it's got a big signal, it's intense, you know, intensity, strength, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so, you know, signals come in all shapes and sizes. How would you describe this current setup in terms of your conviction level? Nine out of 10. This is, okay. So you're not, you're shrinking violent on this one. No. And just to put it in perspective, like, look at, there's this technical algorithms are trading the cues. Um, you know, and there are these levels, like if you don't think technical analysis works, these algorithms sure use it. So just draw some lines on these support levels on the queues. And you'll see, we closed today, we're right, we're trading right now QQQs, 312.92. It's below 313. Now that's a line that we've been going down to about over the last 10 days, a bunch of times. That's kind of like the last line below from here. You know, I mean, but and I got the daily, the model forecast daily, weekly, everything's just turning down. So I think you start taking out some of these technical levels here. You, you can just kind of open up a trap door uh, on on these crazy dip buyers and ODTE option players. Um, by the way, I think ODTE options, it reminds me of portfolio insurance because these guys have been jacking the market up, right? And, and it, just on a daily basis, you know, they buy the dips and it, go, it, it comes from the low of the day, ends up going up, you know, and closing unchanged or something. But this reminds me, I was hired into Solomon back in 86, right? So I was there, been there for a year when the 80, before going into the 87 crash. And I remember <clears throat> portfolio insurance, which was actually invented by my, my mentor, my, one of my other mentors at UC Berkeley, Mark Rubenstein, chairman of the finance department, who actually, you know, helped me get into Solomon. You know, anyways, that's another story. But um, so portfolio insurance back then was you buy the market when it's going up, right? And you just keep jacking things up. And then all of a sudden it worked in reverse and you had the 87 crash. So I'm wondering, this is my investment strategist hat, not my model hat. My model hat says the market's going down. But I'm wondering if this ODTE option stuff, which puts dealers into a portfolio insurance position, right? So they're delta hedging, whatever these maniacs are buying, you know, on a daily basis, you know. Um, so it could turn, I, I think we start breaking some levels here, which the, uh, which the algos have been supporting religiously for the last 10 days. There's like, there's one more below here, you know, about 307 or something. So we're 313 straight shot down to 307 and then what? <laughs> the big trap door, you know. So potential for a major break in the Nasdaq, which I don't think people are prepared for. You know, as as bearish as hedge funds may say they are in surveys, are they short the Nasdaq? Uh, uh I don't think so. I think they're still long semiconductors, software, Fang stocks. So you pull the bottom out of Fang stocks. I think this thing could trade down sharply. And answer your question, my conviction is almost as high as it's been. You know, because I can remember. Wow. And then related to that, um, just elaborate on the last point you made, namely the sentiment um, that you gather from your conversations. I mean, you speak to a lot of people, you've known some of your clients a long time. You can kind of get a sense playing off of people where, where their heads are at. I mean, how, how would you describe sentiment? I mean, you mentioned the CNN thing, but just in terms of your conversations or you know, uh, odd lot indicators. Like, what would you say? Are people complacent? You know, fully invested bears? Like, how would you describe the setup? Um, I think they're wounded uh, bears. Um, so I don't have a real clear insight into this, but I do talk to people. And um, <clears throat> I would say, I mean, you can't not, you can't read these headlines and see the banks going under and all this stuff and say like, Oh, I'm so bullish, right? It's like it's hard to be really like jacked up, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, everything's rosy. Happy days are here again. So it's not happy days are here again. Um, but 
I think that people have ex their exposure is probably down. So I, I that's the impression I'm getting. They're not a lot of conviction. So um, they've been burned. They kind of like put their fire, fingers in the fire too many times, you know, and you burn, you, you're kind of afraid to go like, so kind of afraid to, to commit. I, I guess that's the best thing I could say. And what that means to me is if, again, like I said, we start breaking levels here, things start going down, you're going to get people chasing the, chasing the bus pretty quickly saying, oh my God, you know, I got my bottom at the top, I'm long fang stocks, it, the fang rally's over, it, the economy's weakening, da, 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 you know, on and on and on. So I think, I, I, I think kind of people are more like huddled, you know, in their caves kind of. I would say, um, although I will say, people, I have been getting feedback where the analysts, so I talk to the senior guys, right? You know, like the the first lieutenants or the head of the thing, you know, the generals or the lieutenants. And they tell me their analysts are still bulled up, right? So what do you think? Buy Amazon, you know, like somebody told me that the other day, you know, like, oh, my analyst is telling me to buy Amazon. It's literally best buy. So the the, the analysts, are hopeless you know and i remember one famous hedge fund guy told me that he had to ignore he he hired his analysts so that he could <laughs> so he had to cover to like so his investors so he could say he was doing things on a fundamental basis but then he was doing things tactically and strategically in in the opposite of what they would say but he had to have them on the payroll to keep his investors <laughs> Happy, right? So maybe I'm just speculating here. I don't have a I don't have 100 inside uh, X-ray vision into this. But I'd say overall, people are kind of numb. They don't have big exposure, and the potential for them to start pounding it on the downside is there. Although one caveat: this market, I've learned this the hard way. They will jam it to you. You sell them in the hole, they will rip your face off. So the the thing to do is to do the opposite of what your emotions say, at least for me, my emotions say, it's going up, oh, I gotta cover my shorts, this is, it's breaking out, oh, it's so terrible. That's the best place to short them, okay? That that's, would be like the last nine days. It looks like it's going up, everybody's buying them. And then it breaks down, oh, it's time to press them in the hole, it's going, going, going. That's when you get your face ripped off, ripped off shorting them in the hole. So uh, um, my, you know, I've learned this the hard way, sell the rallies, you know, can bet, bet, they can bounce them for a couple days. And um, I think the dealers, one little secret I've learned is if you look at advances and declines, the dealers accumulate inventory of stocks when stocks go down, right? Nobody wants to buy when they're in the hole. So dealers accumulate this inventory onto the balance sheets. And then you'll notice like a day or two later, all of a sudden there's 2,000 more advances and declining issues. They mark everything up and then people want to buy them. So it gets back to what I was saying about don't sell them in the hole, buy, sell them, do it like the dealers do. So they, they, they accumulate stock, they buy them in the, in the hole when people panic, then they mark them up and they distribute them because people want to buy them back because, oh, the market's up, it feels like it's going up. Blah, blah, blah. So, and then the dealers, that's when the dealers are getting out of their long stock positions, right? And probably going short. So be like them, you know, don't, don't go short in the hole unless it's a crash. It could be, but um, most of the time, you know, you get your face ripped off, sell the rallies. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. Let's go to uh, some of our other folks in the room. First, we're going to do uh, Nostra and then uh, Dave McCoskey. Nostra, good to see you. Floor is yours. Uh, hey, George. Uh, hey, George. Thank Thanks for letting me talk. Um, Michael, I just had a quick question regarding, because uh, you brought up Kinner Ross a couple of times. Um, I was just curious why you're um, more bullish on this than other names, because um, they did, when the Russian sanctions happened, they did have to sell a lot of their very good mines in Russia for basically pennies on the dollar. And, and I think they kind of overpaid for Great Bear. So my question is, why in particular do you really like Kinner Ross? Okay, uh, that's a brand new one for me, bas basically last two, three weeks. If you look at it, um, kind of bottomed again March, you know, about a month ago or so, five, six weeks ago. Um, I all I can say is I, I run KGC divided by XAU. It wants to outperform just starting, second, third inning. And there's a bunch of other names. So, um, again, these were they were out of favor. Uh, um, 
you mentioned that they they, um, they they had some Russian exposure that they had to dump, you know, blah blah blah. Um, uh, good point. Um, those what I've seen in the gold space is when these things happen, um, like a takeover knocks the acquirer stock down, or they, you know, Kinross they sell Russian exposure. Generally, it's setting up for a buy. You know, again, buy it gets gets back to my comments from a second ago. Like buy the dips, you know, don't buy the rallies. So these stocks that were that got smashed are all of a sudden starting to to. Um, uh, to outperform, and I, that's a model thing. So I don't. You probably know more about the fundamentals of this company than I do. All I can say is, in the model forecast, direction up, relative and absolute position, second, third inning, intensity strong, and so it's really become one of my top picks. Um, uh, also, another one, core. So CDE, right? Uh, look at that one. So um, again, it's been in the dumps, kind of a lousy. You know, it's not the most exciting company of all time, right? But it's silver exposure, uh, models bullish on silver, silver gold ratio, et cetera. So uh, these are the these are the stocks that the model's getting a getting an outperform and an absolute buy signal on. Um, simple as that. Uh, kind of, you know, I ca I can't argue with what the model says. I've been doing this for thirty years. I I I either listen, to, I either have a system and I listen to it and it works most of the time, or I don't. So I listen to it. You know, that's what. So that all I can say is the model says, KGC, CDE, stocks like that, AU, another one, uh, stocks that were down and all of a sudden breaking out. Thanks for that. Um, by the way, I know I've had a couple of folks trying to come up, and the app is acting really weird. So. Um, if you can't get up and maybe leave the room and come back because uh, two or three folks have been having problems. Okay, let's go now to uh, Dave Nikoski and then uh, not Chase Coleman. Dave, good to see you. What's on your mind? Hey, George, how you doing? Um, well, I, I've been much more skewed to the bearer side over the last several weeks. Um, you know, most of the relative performance that you're, you're seeing in terms of breadth of the market has come from, you know, the utility staples and uh as well as the, the healthcare sector um you know i'm seeing potential top patterns on the Sox index nvidia with a head and shoulders top Sox index with a head and shoulders top so i'm gonna agree with belkin you know when i see such a narrow market you know and, and you know with retail not doing anything banks can't get off the ground you know i, I don't recall a, a single market throughout history where small caps didn't participate and you know the iwm is so heavily weighted towards banks you know i've run you know charts without the banks and on my run um all i took the s p 500 broke it down by sector looked at advanced decline lines as well as percent above the 50 day and 200 day and you know I, i'm seeing more um degradation in terms of what i'd like to see um you know i i put a chart out today this morning um you know, if I took the top 10 names out of the S&P 500, the index, as of this morning, that was not done with today's price action, you know, it was up 3.14%. You know, so it's it's like trying to, you know, argue that we're in a bull market if you own 10 stocks. And uh, I, I just see so much, you know, degradation in, you know, everything from industrials, you know, trying to read the charts is becoming hieroglyphics. And, you know, for someone that does day trading, that's great. Um, but you know, that's not what my clients do and that's not what I try to, you know, do. And it just, it's just become a mess, you know, trying to, uh, you know, draw trend lines and determine, oh, I'm coming to support. Well, is that a buy? Well, when you're, you know, stuck in a 20% range, you know, it's like channeling doc, you know, channeling stocks.com out of the, you know, the 2000 bubble. Right. Um, you know, some areas of interest that I picked up and I was, Glad to see Tommy Thornton picked it up uh, it, on the same day I did was, you know, Brazil. Um, you know, and this is about two weeks ago. You know, you're, you're seeing and one of the things that, you know, I've said in, in many rooms with you last year is we all become myopically focused on what the U.S. dollar index is, is doing. And, you know, outside of the U.S. dollar index, which contra contrives of seven countries and, um, hasn't changed since the day it was built, you know, with the exception of adding the euro and replacing the Deutschmark and the French franc. But it, all in all, it's the same seven, you know, countries that have been in it since 1972. 
And, you know, I, I'm looking for currency crosses in the emerging markets outside of that. Um, in Brazil, you know, is one of those that came back to a huge support level. They, you know, raised rates at 13.75%, came in when inflation on their last print was 4.75% year over year. You know, I, I don't like the government. Yep. It's socialism. I know everyone wants to own U.S. companies. We've heard that for 12 years. I, I think this is going to open up, you know, uh, more investors to being opportunistic when they need to be in, in some of these countries. You know, Saudi Arabia looks great. Greece looks great. Um, Japan, I'm going doing my international book right now. And I mean, the, the, uh, the size of the bases that I'm seeing in Japan is just ridiculous so i i think that's why buffett's on a plane to uh, japan right now i believe so speaking speaking of things international michael um one question that uh i got someone was asking um about the european markets uh michael noting that um uh they had done uh, considerably better in recent months um than the u.s and what are your thoughts on the european markets <clears throat> uh, good point. Oh, by the way, uh, David, I, I'm in uh, agreement with David about um, the dollar versus uh, EM currencies. <clears throat> so I'm lo I'm short DXY, but I'm long the dollar versus the Brazil real, Mexican peso, Chilean peso, and Turkish lira. Those are the only ones right now. But it's it's so it's bifurcated. It's not dollar down versus everything more, um, th which is also a sign of uh, stress. You know, emerging markets generally underperform in a, in a down, in a credit crisis phase, you know, emerging markets you don't want to be in. So anyways, that's that. Okay. Europe. Good question. <clears throat> okay. I'm watching, um, w there's this Edwards and McGee technical analysis. It's a, it's the handbook of, um, technical analysis. It's written, I don't know, 60 years ago or something. It's, um, <clears throat> it was after the depression and, um, they, he put some, um, it's it's an interesting book to read. Uh, it doesn't, again, technical, I couldn't make technical analysis work systematically in, in my backtesting. I backtested everything in, uh, in when I was building my model and CTA strategies. And I, I, I follow all that stuff, momentum, moving averages, all that stuff. That's not what my model does, but I, I keep an eye on it. Um, but anyways, the book has one pattern in there called broadening top. And he says, this was the classic, uh, broadening top pattern. It's like one, two, three, four, five, five B. Um, you, if you look it up, you can get probably get a picture of it online. You don't have to buy the book, but look at Edwards and McGee broadening top. So um, that's what the DAX is doing. So we had a sharp, really sharp sell off in the DAX. Um, you know, beginning of March. You know, when the bank thing hit, came all the way back, and it's got like a. It almost looks like the it, a, a mirror image of the picture in Edwards of McGee about how stocks topped in 1929. And he said there was, a, that was a, he had one pat stock in there in particular, but he said that that was, I believe my memory serves me right. He's saying um, that was a pattern seen over and over. So it's, it's a sign of exhaustion where it goes up, you go up, sell off, comes back, goes up to about the same level, slightly higher high, and then turns down again, then it's all over. So I, I, I the model forecast, for all these markets, points down. So DAX, CAC, FTSE, all these things. And um, <clears throat> to get back to the sector rotation, same exact thing. So my sector rotation on Europe, which I follow very closely, right? That's page seven in the Belkin report. What do I have for buys? <clears throat> Left-hand column, utilities, just like the US, food and beverages, telecom, healthcare, oil and gas, personal and household goods, Chicken Longs, Beersdorf, Reckitt Bickheiser, Iberdrola, Danone, Telecom, Telefonica, Healthcare, Roach, Novartis, Oil and Gas, ENI, uh, Equinor, things like those are the lo chicken longs. What are cells there? Industrials. Um, industrials look like a disaster to me. Alstom, Ferguson, things like that. Mer Maersk. So by the way, you know, the, the shipping thing is dead in the water, right? These, the shipping rates have fallen. You know, one thing that's happened um, in the last 18 months, do you remember sh shortage of chips? Oh, we've got to build more factories, fabs for chips, right? All of a sudden, Samsung is like cutting, their earnings fall 96% and they're cutting production. And uh, shipping, same thing goes for shipping, right? So shipping rates, we can't get enough ships to ship everything that we need for the... Uh. Anyways, 
shipping rates are falling, the bottom's falling out, bottom Baltic freight index. And so all these shippers, you know, they're, the, the stocks are still way up in the stratosphere. Maersk, um, same thing in Japan, the Japanese shipping stocks. Basic resources, Anafagasco, these are European stocks. Anglo-American, banks. European banks look terrible to me. Banco Sabadell, Deutsche Bank, Jysk Bank, J-Y-S-K-E. That's one. <clears throat> it's, been, it's a high-quality bank, but it's just way up in the stratosphere. Uh, what else? Tech stocks. Um, there's not as many. It's um, there are not as many, uh, you know, benchmark tech stocks in Europe. There's just a few: Infineon, STM, things like that. Those are at the top of my sell list right now. Infineon, STM, ASML, right. Rexel. So, so, so Michael, the Europe is sort of mirroring what's going on in the U.S. Basically. Yes, absolutely. Got it. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay, let's go to um, not Tiger Global, not. Uh, not Chase Coleman. Hey, good to see you again. How are you, George? And hey, everybody. Uh, All good. Good to be here. Uh, hey, Mike. Uh, generally agree with the bearish view, um, especially on technology. Uh, I I kind of half agree with you on meta. I agree that the metaverse has been kind of a science project, for a lack of a better word. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, aside from you know what you mentioned about Facebook, is there any other drivers to the to the short thesis because i will say that most of the valuation I, i'd say the vast majority of the valuation in meta is uh due to instagram and uh click to messaging ads that's driving uh, a pretty high growth source of revenue uh, uh lately across instagram and messenger um and even a little bit on facebook and also just obviously the prospect of TikTok being banned obviously has given the name a lift. So I just wanted to know if you had any other points to the thesis. But other than that, uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Um, good point. So meta to me is, okay, getting back to direction, position, intensity, we're still in the dugout. Okay. The game's about to start. We're not even started the first inning yet. So in the terms of the, I'm just going by the model forecast and it looks like, um, we're, you know, time to step up to the plate, <laughs> you know, first inning, bot bottom of the first inning. Um, um, I will say um, Z Zuckerberg, like, I don't think he knows what he's doing, right? How could you spend like how much it was, eight, ten billion dollars on this thing? He just said, oh, I'm going to get rid of it's, you know, Facebook is boring. Uh, beta is so exciting. Everyone's going to switch to to the metaverse. It's a total flop, right? Like maybe in five or 10 years, who knows? But it hasn't been any, it's no revenue, nothing, just an expense. Yeah. Um, I, I, the other thing I would like to mention is um, I, I think they treat their users like shit, okay? They treat me like shit. I, everybody I talk to, who any, if you question the status quo in any way, shape or form, you, these guys are tapping on your shoulder it's, and by the way, if you look at the head of disinformation or whatever it is, he's from the CIA. They've, they, basically, they've sold out. This is a CIA guy is in charge of setting the standards for what you can and cannot say. This, so Facebook was a wonderful thing, you know, like, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, free expression, you know, you, you know, break, let, move fast, break things. They've turned into this fuddy-duddy, like, let's control go look at, at the uh, community standards for Facebook. It's the biggest bunch of garbage. It's all been disproved. The things on their community standards are things that scientific evidence is disproving on a day-to-day -day basis. All they've done is, is like push this narrative, this big pharma, you know, vaccines are terrible. You got to do, you got to go get vaccinated. Blah, blah, blah. All, all, not only that, the COVID is so terrible. If you don't, blah, blah, blah. like, go look at their the community standards. I, I got dinged on something today for a post I, I put up three years ago. They got these algorithms going down for something. I quoted a doctor. I had a, it wasn't me saying something. I had a quote from a doctor with a picture of the doctor. And they say, you violated our community standards. This is misinformation. So anyways, this big, th I think this is really off-putting to users. So I think they're alienating. They're certainly alienating me. I don't know why I'm even on there, you know? And I think anybody that's, it's slightly off, off, if you're not completely in the libtard camp, they are, they, um, they are obnoxious and they're assholes to you, you know? So I think they're bad, 
they're bad for users. Uh, you know, I, yeah, they might be selling a lot of ads. Maybe, it, it, you know, if TikTok goes under, they'll get a boost from that. But in terms of the stock price, this had a huge rally. Look at it. So Meta, it's just gone from 100 to 213, right? I want to sell it here in short. Yeah, I, I, I agree that the easy money on the long side has been made, 100%. Um, what I will say, though, it just in regards to a potential risk to the short thesis is that... So I know that you mentioned the metaverse CapEx spend, and that has been substantial and probably a little bit too much. Like no one would have given a shit if it was like two billion dollars a year. Like they can rent, you know, I mean, that's like a that's like a rounding error for them, but it's you know, it's like eight to ten billion dollars a year over the next decade. That's a lot of money, right? So I get it. Uh, but what I will say is that a lot of the CapEx that we've seen that elevated CapEx at, is actually not really due to the metaverse. It's actually due to updating their AI um, infrastructure, mainly in the data center. Um, and there will be a lot of normalization in that CapEx. So you could see a big surprise to upside in free cash flow, which could still help support the stock. There's still firing people i mean you can't fire people forever like but i'm just saying that there i mean that, that would be the only thing i would say that could potentially put that at risk because they are just they do generate like the core business just ge generates a shit ton of cash so but that's all i'll say but but thanks man. okay hey um, just a quick follow-up so this was a favorite long for me okay so i just went from long to short so i think everything you're talking about is yesterday's story it's reflected in the stock that's gone up it's doubled, right? It's up 100% since November. So um, a, a, to me, it's a fresh short, just starting almost, you know, again, just walking up to the plate. But first, you know, bottom of the first inning. All right, man. Awesome. Thank you. Michael, how often do you make uh, big changes like this? Um, only most of the time. Uh, it, well, there's no far from rule, but I would say like once or twice a year. And um <clears throat> things things the model changes you know i change and um I, I, here's here's a comment on that it's really really difficult to change your mind it's difficult for me to change my mind and i have a system that i have to follow that to to change my mind right so something's to catch these inflection points it's super important and it's really difficult um so uh I try to make it gradual. Again, you see direction, position, intensity. You can see these things turning. It's the the model forecast kind of looks like a sine wave, you know, left uh, or or normal distribution. You know, left tail, fat part of the middle distribution, right tail. And I have time on the bottom axis. So left tail is the beginning of something. You're moving from left to right is moving through time, and you can see ahead twelve periods. So that's hard to describe verbally, but um, anyways, I I try to make it gradual so i can say like you know in the report i'll say well we're getting it could last another couple of weeks da, 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 or sometimes it's abrupt sometimes it's 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 gradual um but so last year what happened there was only one change negative at the beginning of the year from early the, the end of 2021 all the way down 2022 only one change last year uh october 17th um on change everything sectors uh, you know, so when it sets up in the sectors and the it, and the you know stocks and the groups and the indexes, I see evidence it changes, and I try to make it. And it's never, very rarely, is it exactly to the point. So I was a little bit early on this top this time. Two weeks, at, you know, the last two weeks were really powerful. Last two weeks of uh, March, and I I missed that. But um, uh, you know, it just everything just kept getting worse and worse in the forecast. So this would be. First change this year, I would say, if this works out the way it's supposed to in the forecast, maybe there will be another change late this year. So that's all. Uh, not not that often, you know, once or twice a year. Great. Okay. Let's go to uh, Glow, uh, bro, and then Mark Newman. Glow, bro, the floor is yours. Um, just one uh, question. Thanks for having this, by the way, George. Uh, just a question with, you know, commodities and I guess gold you were specifically talking about with respect to upcoming uh, deflation or deflationary bust that some macro people talk about on Twitter. Um, I know long term I'm a commodities bull as is obvious uh, by my name, but just curious what your thoughts are in the near term, let's say six months down the road. 
Okay, good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, okay, so there's a big divergence. I, I have like sectors. Um, I follow all the commodities and I, you know, I make things into an a equal weighted average of softs, grains, met precious metals, base metals, and energy. Um, right now I'm short base metals. So nickel, tin, aluminum, copper, zinc down. It's not a fresh signal, more like, um, but long term is very strong. Intermediate terms, more like fifth, sixth, I think. Uh, so short base metals, short grains, mainly soybeans. So for some reason, uh, soybeans, soybean, soybean oil, soybean meal, and rice down. Uh, and um, energy, like I said, fresh up, first inning, first, second inning. Crude oil, Brent crude, gasoline. Natural gas is an interesting one. It's been demolished. So if you're looking for a buy low commodity, um, and in a in a in a environment <clears throat> where energy is turning up, uh, you know I'm no expert on the fundamentals. Obviously, you know other people are much more knowledgeable about this than I am. I just have natural gas bottoming. So if you're looking for w one energy play um, that's really in the dumps and has upside potential, could you know could bounce around down here. I don't think it's going to go straight up. But natural gas is the most interesting one to me. And then gold, silver, and palladium, not platinum yet. Um, by the way, the platinum stocks have been really kind of, they've been terrible. Um, the, South, the ones that trade in South African, uh, Anglo-American, uh, things like that, um, Anglo-American platinum, um, they've been real dogs. Um, they might be bottoming. Uh, and I'm not yet, I don't really have a big buy on them yet, but they've gone down so much. Um, also, Australian gold miners uh, were acting terrible for a very long time. There's only about 10 or 20 of them. Uh, and uh, of course, Newmont's buying, uh, you know, new, new, it's, it's just doing a big takeover there, the biggest one. Um, but um, I, I, they look interesting. So uh, if you're a gold stock investor, uh, I'd take a look at the um, Australians. They maybe second, third inning, they're turning up. Um, and so that's it. Like. Negative on base metals, grains, positive on energy and precious metals. By the way, before we go to Mark, um, Mark Michael, um, I received a question. Someone asked, how high could you imagine uh, gold and silver going? Uh, I don't have a number. Um, let me look. Hang on. Remember, the model, so the model doesn't give you uh, a level. It gives direction, position, intensity. So let's see. Physical gold, $2,000 an ounce. It's kind of breaking out. Uh, I don't have a strong answer, uh, but if you go about, start getting above here and staying above here, uh, it could be quite interesting. Um, um, I, I, it's, I tell you the truth, I like silver better. So silver. Silver is not at a new high. So the high on silver was like 28 or something, right? You know, back a couple of years ago. It's only like 25-ish. Uh, I like silver. Silver, has, to me, has more upside potential. And it's kind of the, you know, the brother of, of gold. Um, you know, we, it, it, and when silver, so I go silver divided by gold. Direction up. Position early, just starting. So silver gold ratio, which is a bull market precious metals play up. So I, I answer to your question, I don't know, but it looks like it could break out above um, 2000. It's already there. Uh, but silver looks like way more interesting. Like I think silver has much bigger percentage upside. Awesome. And, and related to that, I had a couple of people question me just now, as long as we're talking about things that are anti-fiat um and not part of the monetary system um question about bitcoin what do you think of bitcoin okay let me look um i missed this it looks like it's breaking out but hang on okay bitcoin just bear with me one second i don't like to answer without going to the model right so let's go to the videotape as they used to say just bear with me one second Okay, Bitcoin, BTC. Yeah, I'm not real happy. I'm not 
really liking it. It's more like eighth inning, ninth inning. Um, I don't, you know, I know it's not <clears throat> fiat and, you know, it's, it's not gold, it's digital gold and everything that, uh, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of Bitcoin at the moment here. It's too late. I, I wouldn't chase it. Got it. One other question someone asked, I, I think I know the answer. REITs? I know REITs, okay, REITs, I, are, REITs are very heterogeneous, so um, and I know it's part of financial. So should I just assume we're negative, or do you not get do you not get granular into the subsectors of REITs? Yeah, not not into the subsectors. Um, hang on, XLRE divided by S and P down late, so down seventh inning, but um, something that makes me nervous. They they've been acting better the last few days. Have you noticed? Um, you know, it, it's and I see. Uh, uh, Somewhere I have a news story. One of the things I do in the Belkin Report, so when I'm not working 12 hours a day, <clears throat> applying the model to the forecast to everything, I'm reading. So, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then the rest of the time from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., um, I'm reading Bloomberg, FT, uh, Reuters, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Ugh. There's usually their hit rate is very low, but it's what have to read it, um, et cetera, you know, and, and, you know, news, legit, legitimate news sources. Um, somewhere in there, I saw that the hedge funds are massively short REITs. It's like one of the biggest short positions, which makes fundamental sense, right? The economy's going down, you know, the credit, you know, it, it makes a lot of fundamental sense. But I think there's the potential for a short squeeze. So you don't see me, you didn't see me mentioning REITs as a top short recommendation. Um, I, it's kind of late in the signal where the other signals are early, just starting. And the potential for a short squeeze, I just, you know, just kind of makes me nervous. So I have them as a short, but it's kind of low conviction. Got it. All right. Now let's go to Mark Newman and then we'll go to Brian and then Anika. Mark, good to see you. What's up, man? Hey, George. Hey, everybody. Um, Michael, I gotta say, there's so many great guests all the time on George's spaces, but I really enjoy hearing you and, your comment briefly just before about reading the FT and the Times and the Journal. It's so old school that it just it's just refreshing to hear that, Michael, even though credible news sources are getting farther and farther uh, between now. A um, couple things. Uh, George hit me, uh, got ahead of me there with Bitcoin and someone else with gold. That's all good. Um, I wanted to just say, like, I initially thought Q1 of this year was a factor shift in very early January, sort of I termed it the reversion of 2022's reversion, you know, Amazon down 50 last year, up like what, 25 or so this quarter. I get the sense from what you're saying, you feel as if that reversion, that Q1 reversion has sort of come to an end, so to speak. And then to that point, how do you used to call them the chicken longs? It sounds as if you're still feeling pretty good about chicken longs here now, or at least that's sort of the defensive posture. And finally, Q1 earnings is coming up in the next few weeks. What is your, I know you mentioned earnings briefly before, but I wondered if you had a near term view on the earnings into this cycle. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Reversion. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. I wrote your, let me write this down. Chicken longs. Okay. You got three questions there. All right. Yes. Uh, the the bounce in um, in crappy stocks and in fang stocks um, is over in my work. So uh, I was enthusiastically long them for five months. Um, you know, cloud software, all that kind of stuff. Uh, fang over, short, aggressive, short. Now here, right here, sell the shit, sell the hell out of them. Okay, chicken longs. Wait, yeah, just, just starting, second, Michael. This is sort of. It, 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 your 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 conviction level and your idea here sounds like you did. I'm gonna say, like May June last year. Is that fair to say your confidence level is similar? Yeah, same okay. same kind of thing. So next down wave starting. So okay. stocks, Twilio, Datadog, Team, Fuzzly, all those kind of things. Favorite longs for me till a couple of weeks ago. Now top shorts, semiconductors. You remember semiconductor shortage. We don't have enough semiconductors. Got to buy the semiconductors. Okay. Nope. Sorry. SMTC, Marvel, you know, NXPI, RUN, ON, LRCX, AMAT, all those things. Um, uh, okay. Chicken longs, just starting. Again, first inning, 
middle of the first inning, you know. Um, so, so uh, again, you know, you heard, I, I was, I went through all this stuff, you know, it's, it's utilities. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't need to re repeat myself. Yeah, you know, no, but, you did. I just was confirming. And then yeah, any quick thoughts on EPS? And um, then I'm gone. Yeah. I, I, okay. So I just ran, th I, I started off, with, I think I'd mentioned that at the, sort of towards the beginning. Okay. I just, right before this, you know, right before we started this, I downloaded the latest data. And um, so, by the way, on earnings, um, that consensus stuff to me, you know, um, is such gibberish. You know, it's so, it, it's so, that's what everybody looks at and values stocks on, but um, it, it's so soft. It's so like, it's like a, you know, it's like candy, it's like candy cotton, cotton candy. You know what I mean? It's like you stick your finger in it. it it's so it, it, what they're, what they're looking for and what happens always changes. So I use standard and pours. <clears throat> okay. I got this from Bob Solomon, Solomon brother. He was the only Solomon brother left at Solomon brothers when I was there. Um, okay, head, he was head of equity research, a real stickler, okay, he was real, all my bosses there were real, like, hard-nosed guys, and um, we got along great, um, I wasn't, I, I was sort of a, I was just a mobile quant in those days when I started out, so I would get kind of parachuted in to quantify some, he, they, they'd have a project they were working on for some research publication or something, I would do the, the grunt work for it, and um, so in, in the process of doing that, he, I learned from him, use standard and poor's numbers. So standard and poor's puts this out. You can get this from the spreadsheet from them and they have operating earnings and reported earnings. And these guys are the freaking index provider, right? They've been doing it. They invented the S and P right standard and poor's. So I I've always, I've always used their numbers and they have a forecast thing on there too. And um, their forecast is always too high, always. So whatever they say, like, I mean, as far as I can remember, it's all, it's just always wrong. And, you, and so they, they keep revising it down as more and more companies report, you know, so right now it's like 3% of reported or something. And so they're looking uh, to give you the numbers again. I, I did this. So operating earnings right around 50 bucks for, uh, for Q, for Q1 and 197 annualized. That's their number. That's the official standard and poor's number. Um, 50 is not, is not official yet. That's the squishy one that probably be revised down reported numbers, 45, um, and 171. So annual numbers are already way below 200. That's not what, what you see when you read Bloomberg and, you know, what you call it fact set, right? So, um, where I, I think this economy goes down the tubes these earnings are going to go down big time. It's kind of taken a lot longer than I thought. I thought this last year, but nothing's changed. The forecast I just looked at, it's still down. And so we get a credit crisis. Um, you know, I think even more important than the numbers. So the, the banking thing hit at the beginning of March, right? So things were doing hunky dory until, you know, January, February. Then all of a sudden, March. <laughs> so I think we're going to see things are coming in weaker. Than companies expect it won't affect everybody it'll affect the banks but then you're going to hear these comments from um intermediate you know size companies saying oh all of a sudden you know things started slowing down credit availability da, da, da. so i think the the forward guidance from these reports is likely to be dreadful not 100 percent across everything but we're going to say and, and look at so again hanky got into this today, um, I think on his YouTube video, I'll keep mentioning, um, the ISM manufacturing index is like at 46 something, right? It's like six months now, I think, below 50. So we're in a recession on, based on ISM manufacturing, not services yet, um, but although the services thing fell at rapidly too. So long story short, wrap it up. So I'd say manufacturing is going to be dreadful. Cyclicals, guidance will be terrible. Earnings should be bad. We're, that's why these, they're starting to get slammed, you know, Caterpillar and all these stocks. They bounce, bounce back some, but they're going down. And then the guidance should be horrible. And then so, uh, you know, as this is, well, where are we now? April 12th. So this won't appear, I guess this week we start with the banks. So the banks, um, 
you're not going you are not going to be hearing a lot of happy happy days are here again stories from you know J what are they going to say JP Morgan you know they're the big banks that that start uh, uh, announcing and then the smaller banks after them so banks should be terrible um and then the cyclicals should be terrible and the guidance should be horrible so you know i think that realistically number again reported it's 171 now where do you see that? Do you see that reported on facts on anywhere? That's official standard and pours. So where could it go? That could go down to the low hundreds somewhere. Great. Awesome, Mike. Thank you. Good. Let's go to uh, our good friend Tom Thornton and then Newton. Tommy, good to see you. What's on your mind? Hey, gang. Uh, hey, Michael. This was uh, really, um, really a great uh, summary of Q2 and what you expect and um, – Congratulations on nailing the October lows. That was a great call. And I'm just going to say I'm, I'm with you on your thought that the FANG stocks and the tech names that have done so well, uh, the few of them, uh, 10 of them, I guess, that uh, those are due for a meaningful correction. And I actually am short those currently. And I, I think that um, this is actually one of the times that we all look back and go, boy, this is a, there's a lot of hopium out there in this market. And you can look at a name like NVIDIA, which is sort of the poster child for this market run up. And it's, it's, it's a great company. Uh, it's not necessarily cheap uh, by any means for any semiconductor. Uh, it's the most valuable one, I think, currently right now. And it's, it, it's sort of moved through different narratives and it it was a a pc story with uh, gaming and then it was the data centers it was going to take over the world it was crypto for a while and now ai and it's moved up on this whole hope that um as jensen wang said that it, you know their orders are exploding he's a very much a i mean as ceos go he is the most hypey CEO I've ever heard in my life. He always wears the same black leather jacket, but I think that um, I think they're going to have uh, difficult times going forward. And you just keep I, I keep reading these reports, and you know AMD is another one that I'm short, uh, and that's gone up uh, a lot. But you you have these reports that PC sales are plunging, and I'm not saying like just the Apple ones. Overall, I mean Gartner has been out, and they're one of the most accurate uh forecasters i know the one of the analysts i used to work with at my hedge fund uh they're not necessarily bears when it comes to technology because they sell technology research and they'd much rather be uh, bullish but that's what they're reporting and that's what they're seeing really really deep uh declines and if you just go back to any other time in technology world or history uh when there's job layoffs that means there's fewer phones that need to be bought, fewer computers, uh, fewer data centers that are going to be needed. Uh, the, I think that there's just a, a big glut out there uh, in semis. And you saw the, the Micron News and Samsung News that they're, they're cutting CapEx. They're, I mean, huge. And you saw the semi-cap companies rally the other day with Micron ripping higher. I mean, look, lower capacity is part of the the solution but we're not through this at all and some people said that samsung cutting 15 percent, they need to cut 30 percent, and that's a big number so i think it's uh it's moving in that direction and if we go into a recession that means there's layoffs um, companies aren't buying new employees laptops or phones or all these things so i think that you're you're right on as far as with the technology um, I, I, I missed your thoughts on where you are with energy in the energy sector. Maybe you can go through that. Sure. Hey, um, hey yeah, I've seen your stuff, Tom, on uh, the, the uh, tech S&P ratio. I totally agree with you. I've seen you put that out on Twitter recently. Um, uh, yeah, same tech topping. Um, and uh, <clears throat> let me go through... Here's just a little observation. So I have, again, remember page six of the report is longs on the right, left, shorts on the right. And um, just to put things in perspective right now, the longs are, I, I have like 10 or 12 groups 
and it takes up like one third of the page in the left hand column. The right column, the shorts, it fills up the entire page. It's like three times as as the length of my longs, my shorts. <laughs> and not only that, um, I find just to to lay this page out, I I put commas between stock symbols, right? And I, I can't put, I have to stop, t I have to put the, take the commas out because there's not enough room. I run out of room on the bottom of the page, you know what I'm saying? Because there are so many tech stocks that I have that are shorts. So I'm gonna have to like change the font size or something on the shorts. And to get back to your semiconductors, like I just look at these, I have, you know, I mean, stocks that you mentioned, yeah. And then KLAC, uh, every semiconductor stock, TS, Taiwan Semi, TSM, right? Cold stock. I got that one rolling over. Amat, you know, if they're going to be cutting back on production, then the the manufacturers, you know, the fab makers, uh, all that stuff. So yeah, semiconductors terrible. Internet, all these tech stocks, te the leading tech stocks down. Nvidia, all that kind of stuff. Okay, energy. I'm a big fan. I changed two weeks ago. Um, it was uh, there was an event, of course. OPEC cuts production that morning. I, I ran it through the model and it changed everything. So it hit the model threshold, threshold model, hit the signal. So crude oil up starting two weeks ago. So we're in the first, second inning, um, just starting. Direction up, intensity strong, position just starting. And uh, energy stocks, which had been a short for me, okay, XLE, all these energy stocks. And uh, just to review, um, XLE went down 19% from January 26th to March 20th. So these are the kind of moves I try to catch, you know, and as investors, you don't want to sit through 20% moves against you, right, in, in an asset class. I want to try to catch them, and I'm not, I'm not going to do it with 100% precision, obviously. Uh, but um, that one I caught. So I was short uh, energy stocks, saying to underperform. They flipped around, boom. When, that, when the OPEC news hit, short to long. So, um, so right now, I'm long. Oil and gas, DVN, EOG, OXY, MUR, MRO, CVX, APA, things like that. Um, it keeps unfolding. There's more we, more new ones added every week as they move into rotation. So, uh, yeah, I do like energy. I like gold. And other than that, it's the chicken longs, you know, utilities, consumer staples, and healthcare. Um, we didn't talk about healthcare too much, but um, they were shorts for me too, by the way. So, uh, um you know, you didn't ask this, but I'll offer it anyway. So things like um, uh, chicken longs, eat Lily, J and J, you know, uh, Sanofi, Pfizer, you know, you know, um, things like that. Um, they were shorts for me, and they sold off. That so there was this big reversal starting a couple weeks ago in the sector rotation, and energy came in after. You know, first it was utilities, first it was staples, then utilities in healthcare. And again, we're just in this very beginning of the game, first, second inning in this stuff. Oil and gas, first inning. So like energy, uh, hate semiconductors. Thanks so much. Great answer. Uh, all right. If, you, if anyone else has questions, um, Newton has got the, the next questioner. I don't see anybody else. If you have a question, raise your hand. Otherwise, I think we're going to bring this room to a close. We started at 4.15, so we're going on an hour and 45 minutes. Michael's been extremely uh, generous with his time. Uh, Newton, the floor is yours. How about Thanks, it? George. Awesome, Michael. Hey, your comment about uh, the amount of time you spend reading got me thinking about, I mean, how do you incrementally use that in terms of interpreting your models, or do you not do that at all? Are you just using it to be informed so that the clients you speak with you know, you kind of anticipate what's there, what are their hot buttons and how it might relate to what you're, um, you know, putting out incrementally or does, does what you're reading temper, you know, your interpretations of your own models? How do you, how do you view that? Um, great question. Okay, so um, first of all, the first thing that springs to my mind to answer that is hit rate. The hit rate of things that are worth reading in the things that I read is mostly very low. So like I said, New York Times, I, I mean, I scan, I, 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 I have a, so you can scan the daily news. There's like an outline for all these things. 
I try to scan the headlines and I'm looking for what I don't know. I'm not looking to reinforce my convictions, right? I'm looking because things change, right? The, the, the economy is the most complex thing. It's like, it's like physics or something. You, 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 who knows what's going to happen next? It's, it's very uncertain. Things come out, out of left field and I'm looking for new developments. What's changing at the margin? OPEC, that was a big development, right? So, uh, I, I, again, I'm very critical of a lot of the stuff I read because the hit rate of what is worth reading is so unbelievably low. So it actually makes my job easier. So the New York Times, I can screen through, you know, and read, blah, 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 blah. blah. It takes me about three minutes to find the needle in the haystack. And maybe there's like one story every three days or something. <laughs> I don't know what it is about them, but they, they are pushing a narrative, you know. So it's, I hate bias. I don't want biased information, right? I want information. So um, what, so F New York Times, terrible. Financial Times, slightly better, but very long-winded. And I, I see a lot of rehashes of stuff that I've read elsewhere. So Financial Times, sorry, I know the ed U.S. editor's old friend. Sorry, Gary, <laughs> if you hear this. <laughs> but um, hit rate, very low. For me, I mean, maybe I'm not your target market probably, you know, but I'm looking for unbiased information, what is new, and what what's interesting, you know, what what is what's changing at the market? Okay. Wall Street Journal, great. Like I I, I find so much information. In the journal, who's editing that? Unbiased. So I, why they dig deep. You know, they, Michael, you're, you're yeah. breaking up on us. Michael, you moving around? You're you're breaking up on uh, no. us right now. Hello? That, is that better? Hello. Hello, 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 so. hello, hello. Hello, hello. Is that hello. better? Go, go, hello, go hello. Ahead. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, moved into the hall here. Um, okay, so Wall Street Journal, great. I find very high hit rate, worth reading. And then um, Bloomberg, uh, you know, I think it's very badly edited. The, 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 the overall thing, if you go to the Bloomberg website, and you start screening through, it's a bunch of public interest garbage, right? But there's some great, great stories there. So Needle in the Haystack, Bloomberg is fantastic, but you have to dig for them. So um, uh, Bloomberg, great. Reuters, not as good as Bloomberg. Some good stories there, but you have to dig for them. So maybe not as good of a hit rate and slightly biased. So I just hate people that are pushing an agenda. I don't want an agenda, I want information. So just to give you, so the first page of the Belkin Report is press clips. Let me just read you the headlines of what I ran this week. It's about eight or 10 stories. Wall Street Journal, April 10th. Auditors didn't flag risks building up in banks. <laughs> Auditors didn't notice it. FT, April 5th. Diamond turns on regulators after banking turmoil spooks investors. Great story. Here's what he says. Ironically, quote, banks were incented to own very safe government securities because they were considered highly liquid by regulators and carried very low capital requirements. That's why I started out this presentation saying, same thing. Yeah, hello. The Matrix again. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Michael, hello. Hello. Get, yeah, Michael, get squishy so again. I don't know what you're doing. Anyway. Okay. Uh, I, I must be losing the signal. Anyways, so uh, I'm looking uh, for. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Go Hear ahead. Me? Go ahead. Yeah. I, I think I think the point was clear. You're not. You're trying to avoid confirmation bias. You're looking for nothing. I think that's the point you're trying to make. No. Yeah, and I'm trying to present to investors my own narrative out of using the stories that are in mainstream media that you have to dig for. So basically 90, 95% of what's published out there is irrelevant to me. Maybe it's like human interest or it's worth reading or something. But in terms of what's the future of the markets, what's going on, what's going to happen next, what's happened, you know, you're digging for diamonds, you know, I'm digging for diamonds. And um, yeah, so that's what I do. I try to dig for diamonds, try to find the needle in the haystack, and uh, it's not so easy and it's very time consuming. And it makes me very cynical about mainstream media and how it's edited. I, there's things that I'd like 
and there's things that I despise, and there's things that just are absolutely not worth reading at all because they're so unbelievably biased. Michael, one question that's come in, and we're going to close this room in a minute. One question that's come in from a couple of sources was about credit spreads. I know you say you're negative on um, uh, you expect spreads to widen. Uh, so far, they've been relatively well behaved. Hello, 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 Hey, Nostra or Mark Newman, can you hear me? Or anybody up? Anyone who's a speaker? Yes, yes sir. We can hear clear. Just not Michael. Yeah, I think we kind of lost Michael. Well, <laughs> I think we're going to. Um, I think we're going to have to call it a day with no Michael. What are we going to do? So, um, all right, this is a good way to end the room, I suppose. <laughs> It's been a great room. Um, Michael, we thank you. I don't know if you can hear us or not, um, but uh, it's it's really been uh, terrific. Um, let's see. Hold on. Who else is up here that hasn't spoken? Cantor, did you just Yeah, it's not here? up here. I'll, 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 another Michael, just I'll, I'll answer. I'll give you my two cents. Um, sure. Claims, claim, uh, when spread, spreads blow out, when claims blow out, period. It hasn't happened Got yet. It. And it's a claim, claims just start and turn. Okay, fair enough. Um, anything else you want to add? As long as you're up here, it's always a treat to have you. Uh, no, it looks like Michael's back. Um, no, I don't want. I don't want to keep people hanging on. Uh, no, he's he, he's he's here, but we can't. Uh, I don't know where. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I missed this. I, I didn't see uh, this. You use there, 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 there will be a replay. Don't worry on YouTube as well as the regular sources. All right, um, that's it. We we ended with Michael, different Michael, but Michael's the Michael's the go-to name. So, thanks everyone. We'll do another space before too long. This has been great. Thanks for all the questions, and a thank you to Michael Belkin. Um, be sure to follow him, and if you're interested, reach out to him for uh, about the Belkin report. Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>